Find your seat. We are about to get into God's Word. And we want to welcome all of you who are here joining us on Facebook. There's nothing like being live, but I'm sure you had a good reason to be home. Amen. But today I have a, I have a word from the Lord for you. I titled this message, Disarming Darkness. Darkness is prevailing over the land but we're here to serve notice to the powers of darkness. Their time is about to be over. The years of dominion are about to be over. How do you overcome darkness? In your own personal life, I know there's some of you going through the battle of your life. You have felt the oppression. You have felt the resistance. You try to move forward. And you feel the attack every time you decide to do something for the Lord, even as something as simple as coming to church, even as something as simple as being able to just call upon the name of the Lord. You feel this resistance, this darkness, because the enemy loves to dominate. He loves to control. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy, the Bible says. And so today, I want to give you three steps. These are action steps. This is not a sermon. This is a, this is a word for you to apply in your life because this is coming straight from the throne of heaven. Spend a lot of hours in prayer seeking the Lord regarding this message. I know without a shadow of doubt that this is what the Lord will have you do. And the first thing that the Lord will have you do is that you need to establish a prayer altar. Prayer altar. What is a prayer altar? Let me tell you what it's not. A prayer altar is not when you put, gather a whole bunch of little idols or big idols or medium-sized idols. And then you put protection bands and amulets and all kinds of gadgets that come from the other side. That's not a prayer altar. And we'll address that later on. A prayer altar is a place in time where heaven meets earth. When you're in communion with Jesus through prayer. It's, it's, it's a moment when you invite the presence of God to come and abide. And for you to spend time with Jesus. You got to understand that there's a correlation between having a prayer altar. And being able to possess the lamb. To be able to move forward. Something happens when you pray. I want to share some things with you that probably you have not realized that what happens when you pray and why the devil is always looking for a way for you to stop praying. You ever notice when it's time to pray, everybody wants to call you? You ever notice when you, when you start to pray, you get all the distractions in the world? Even good things could come your way to distract you from praying because the enemy knows that when you pray, something happens. But what is that something that happens? I believe that when you pray, you begin to experience a pillar of fire all around you. I call it the fire wall. Can somebody say the fire wall? The Bible says in Zechariah, and you'll find it right there in your notes, in Zechariah chapter 2, verse 5, it says that he will be, talking about the Lord, the Lord will be a wall of fire all about you and a glory in your midst. My son Joshua, who him and his wife, the the youth pastor, uh, the, the, the youth in our, in our church, and what a weekend they had with black voices that were here. Come on. They just tore it up. They went, it was, amen. God did an amazing thing through them, and then they went evangelizing. They had an awesome concert here on Friday. Well, my, 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 uh, my son gets hired to do one thing. He works in cyber security. He turned out to be smarter than his dad. <laughs> and if those of you who remember many years ago when computers first came out, do you remember when all the spam used to come? How many remember the days of computers 256? You're giving away your age. I remember having this computer and all kinds of things were popping and anybody could invade your computer. Yeah, I, I needed a firewall. Because when you don't have a firewall in your computer, then all kinds of viruses 
people intentionally will send an attack with viruses and they have one mission and that is to take over your computer. I'm going somewhere with this. Because I'm here to tell you that the enemy has one mission, and that is to take over your mind and your heart and your spirit, over your body, over your life. He will send his viruses. He will send his messages. He will send the arguments. But God has promised you that when he is in with you, there will be a firewall all around you. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 3 verse 2, And then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire in the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire. Can somebody say fire, yeah, yeah. Yet the bush was not being consumed. Then he says, take your shoes off because you're standing in holy ground. Do you see the relationship? Then when the fire of God comes uh, as a result of having an encounter with God, the ground gets affected. The environment gets affected. God becomes, uh, a man takes dominion of the atmosphere. He begins to take charge of the region. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 18 verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stone and the dust. And, and he lifted up the water that was in the trench. This is Elijah who had prayed. The people of, the people of God and the people of Israel had turned their backs on God. They, they wanted to dibble in both sides. Have you ever met people who want to be on both sides? They want to please everybody. They want to they wanna please every God that they could get their hands on. And they were trying to please Baal and they were trying to please God Almighty. And God says, how long would you stand before two of Opinions. Make up your mind. Touch at least three people and tell them, make up your mind. You got to make up your mind. Who are you going to serve today? God does not vacillate. God does not, listen to me. God is a God that is straight up with every single one of us. He wasn't playing games at the cross of Calvary. It is not a, something that you carry around your neck. Uh, it's something that really, really happened. Uh, it is an event that changed the history of mankind. Uh, and then after that was the resurrection of Jesus. Why did he go through all that? To save you, to deliver you, to break the bondage of sin uh, and the, the bondage amen of, of the kingdom of darkness the fact is the fact is that when elijah called upon the name of the lord the fire came down but it doesn't stop there acts chapter 2 verse 3 and 4 and tongues that look like fire this is when they were praying for 10 days, waiting for that day of Pentecost. It was a feast that, that was celebrated. It's the feast of harvest. Uh, and now we understand it was the feast of harvesting souls before the coming of the Lord. That many will come to Jesus. The Bible says here that tongues that look like fire... Uh, appear to them, distributing themselves, and a tongue resting on each of them. And then it, the Bible said they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with different tongues as the Spirit was giving them the ability to speak out. So they began to speak in this heavenly language. This is straight up from the Bible. This is when the church started. If you want to see what the church should look like, it should look like that. A church that is on fire for Jesus, filled of the Holy Spirit, filled, amen, with the power of God, being able to talk to God even in a heavenly language. But I want you to take notice. The emblematic, uh, uh, visible a, a, a symbolic, it's actually beyond symbolic, it's more than a symbol here. It was a visible, tangible event that took place. If you were to close your eyes and God were to show you people around here, they will look in four ways. There will be those who don't know Christ in this place and you have zero fire in your life. 
Zero fire. There is no fire of God. There is no presence of God. You don't have the Holy Spirit. You don't have God in your life. Uh, you may know about God, but you don't know God. You don't have an experience. You haven't had an experience with him. We, we, a lot of people know things about him, but do you have a relationship with him? If you don't, you can know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior today. He will cleanse you of every single one of your sin. I'm not offering you religion. I'm offering you a relationship. Because one of these days, he will either be your savior or your judge. The good thing is you get to choose now whether he will be your savior now. And if he's not your savior now, he will be your judge later. It is your decision. But then there's a second kind of a person who have the Lord, but the fire is very small inside of them. As a matter of fact, if you were to talk to some ex-Satanists, they would tell you exactly what I'm telling you. When they go into TM, Transcendental Meditation, and they leave their bodies, and they travel, and, and, and witches, and warlocks, and, and santeros, uh, when they get engaged in this kind of activity, uh, I'm talking about high-level uh, engagement of darkness, they will tell you that they will see exactly what I'm telling you right now. And no surprise because the Bible is telling us that we have the fire of the Holy Spirit. So my question to you, are you the first class or category of Christian that just got a little flame? It's like a little flame in the oven. Just a little fire. And then the second one is the type that will have the fire, but that fire only reaches so high. And I want you to imagine a dome of darkness. The Bible says that the Satan is the prince of the power of the air, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. The Bible tells us that we wrestle not in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. We wrestle not against power, against uh, ag flesh and blood, but against power. We got a, a lot of good preachers in this church. And I'm glad you know the word. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Your problem is not the person sitting right next to you that you're angry at. It's not the person back home. It's not your mom and your dad. That's not your real enemy. Your real enemy, the Bible says, uh, that you wrestle. The word there is agonizo. There is an agonizing. There's a battle. There's a, there's a, you're in battle mode all the time because you're in the middle of a war. The Bible says that there's powers and principalities and high places. So they create like this dome. That's why you could walk into certain blocks in certain regions and you feel that darkness. You feel like this dome. And as a matter of fact, some of you, when you pray, you feel like your prayers are hitting the ceiling. How many of you have ever experienced that? Raise your hand. Come on. We, we all have, right? You have prayed and it's like, doom, doom. And it doesn't break through. And I'm going to tell you in a second why it doesn't break through. And why your prayer altar, you could have a prayer altar and not have an effective prayer altar. It's very possible that you pray, but then you're sabotaging the, the effects that could happen when you activate your faith and you persevere. And then you have the last category. And those are the Christians that are so lit with God. They're so filled with God because they spend time in prayer and fasting. And not just during 21 days of prayer and fasting. Can somebody say amen or ouch or ay, 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 canta no llores. Because there's Christians that only pray when you have a schedule for them. It's whenever the church says we're going to do this, 21 days are over, they go back into feasting, and then they, they, all of a sudden the prayers become non-effective. Let me tell you the prayers that are effective. The prayers that are effective is the prevailing prayer. It's a prayer that doesn't stop, that doesn't give up. They penetrate through the dome of darkness. Look at it like a lazing beam of fire going up uh, and melting the dome and getting through. And then there's a smoke. The Bible says uh, in the book of Revelation that the smoke uh, uh, of the prayer it symbolizes the prayer of the saints. The prayer of the people of God. Saints means separated one. Those who have separated their lives to follow Jesus. Their God could smell that prayer. And when God smells the prayer watch out because everything changes when God says I'm going to do something about it 
So my question to you today is, how much fire do you have? Are you throwing water on the fire? I, I, have you stopped praying and seeking God? Are you sabotaging? This is exactly why the devil wants you to stop praying. And by the way, you could be praying. Have you ever started praying and all of a sudden your phone is right there and starts ringing? Listen to what happens. You go to your phone, you watch, and when you get back, it's not the same. My wife don't like it when I'm speaking to her. Hello. I'm speaking to her, and all of a sudden, somebody calls, and I say, stop one second. Let me see who it is. I'm having a conversation with A and B, who are intimately involved with each other, husband and wife, in love with each other. And I want to tell you something. The same thing is with the Lord. Shut the phone. Shut everything down. Shut your computer. That's why the Bible says go to your prayer class. Come on, if you're going to clap, clap like you know that you have a God that answers prayer. And this is why the Bible says you got to go to your prayer closet. The prayer closet is your war room. It's where you go and you seek the Lord and you don't allow any distractions to come in. You say, Pastor, that sounds serious. Yes, because it is serious. Because your prayer life will have a direct impact on your marriage. Your, your, your prayer life will have a direct impact on your attitude. It will have a direct impact on the spiritual ambience that you bring in. It will have a direct impact on your children. Children deserve parents to be praying parents. I don't care what we have accomplished in our life. But if we are not connected with the Lord. If we are not connected with a being of fire that is coming from here up on heaven glory to be that God our children are left on their own but I believe that God is raising up a remnant I believe that God is raising up a people that said I'm going to be an example to my children of what it means to have prevailing prayer can somebody say amen, amen. and so you got to punch through you got to punch through the heavens so you can have what we call a breakthrough prayer this is why when we have prayer time, you know, one of the things the enemy would love for you to do when it's time to say, okay, it's time to pray as a church. You just go, okay. Kumbaya, my Lord. Kumbaya. Listen, the devil is not interested. The devil is not intimate. He's not intimidated by your Christian jingles. He is intimidated when somebody understands I am a child of the king. God has given me authority. God has given me power. God has given me his presence. And I'm going to punch through the heavens with my prayer. And I'm like Jacob. I'm not letting go until I get blessed. I'm not letting go until my community change. I'm not letting go until gang members come to Jesus. I'm not letting go until my child comes back to Jesus. I'm not letting go until the healing comes. I'm going to pray and I'm going to punch through the heaven. Do I have anybody in this how that is ready to punch 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 through the heavens punch through the heavens most Americans pray for one minute and they think ah, ah. you know what people in the dark side they spend hours and so brujeria and their witchcraft they spend hours they spend thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars in the crowd. Because what you need to understand, the other side has altars as well. As a matter of fact, there's altars in the street. There's altars in the other street. I dare say that every block in the Bronx has an altar. But here's, here's that victory. The most effective prayer altar wins. Because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We're not intimidated by the devil. We're not scared of the devil. See, some of you, you're scared of the devil. I don't want to talk about the devil because he's going to do something to me. He's going to do something to you anyway. You might as well fight back. 
Don't allow the spiritual bully to come and intimidate you. You have Jesus in your heart. You got Jesus all around you. You got the authority of Jesus Christ inside of you. Why would you be intimidated by the devil? You remember when Jesus went and saw, he went to a region. He, he, now he's walking into a region. You see, when you walk to a region, you walk through a block, you walk uh, through a neighborhood, you come to Kingsbridge, you come to Fordham Road, wherever you go, the demons are watching. Who's coming? When Jesus showed up, the Bible says there were two demon-possessed men. And they said immediately, they didn't play no games. This demon said, well, are you coming to give us the judgment already? They understood who Jesus was. They understood that he had the Father and the Holy Spirit with him. They understood the presence of God. When you walk in with Jesus and you live in a consecrated life, you're not flip-flopping. You're not trying to play both sides. You're not compromising. You live in a consecrated life to God. When that happened, when you said, God, for God, I live, for God, I die. There's nobody more important than you, Jesus. You're the God that I serve. You're my first love. Not my mother, not my brother, not my sister, not my grandmother, not my children, not my child, not my my title nothing in my life is more important than you when that happened and you walk into a neighborhood i want to tell you it's like fire power the fire begins scorch everything that stands in the way i remember one day i was in california and we were living in uh in, in, in somar california and this guy from across the street man there was a lot of a darkness in the home and one day that guy came one of the guys came out of there yelling and screaming I mean he came like he's gonna throw down now here's me and my brother right there and so when he came down I remember my twin brother stepped forward he says in the name of Jesus I rebuke you Listen to me because I'm not exaggerating. I'm not being evangelistic. As soon as he started going, yeah, yeah, yeah. As soon as my brother said, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you. He went like this. And he went back. Never to see him again. I go, we go, I, with my college days, this is 30-something years ago, and we're going through Baja, California. I'm going with one of the most foremost uh, 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 missionaries and, and we're going to neighborhoods. They haven't heard the gospel. They haven't heard it for a long time. They had no electricity and we will bring a, a, a Jesus movie and we'll play and we will do auto calls and tons of people will get saved. I remember we're coming with a trailer and all of a sudden comes this guy, demon possessed, man. The, I'm telling you, demon, he's coming and he's shelling at us and I ah, turn back. You know, the demons are talking. Man, I love what the missionary did. The missionary look at him and he says, in the name of Jesus, get out of here. That guy went poof and escaped. Let me tell you, later on, he came that night, he gave his life to Jesus and started serving God. God is greater. The fact of the matter is, God is calling us for intense prayer. When it's time to pray in this church, I want to serve you notice that we're not just going through some ritual. When it's time to pray, it's time to lit the fire. Oh, I'm here to give you a word. It's time to get lit up. It's time to get lit up. That word has been in my heart all week. You got to get lit up for Jesus. Come on, you get lit up for basketball teams, for football teams, uh, baseball teams. You get lit up for money. You get lit up for a lot of things. But this is the moment you got to get lit up. Uh, and all full of the fire of God inside of you. So wherever you go, the power of God begins to move. Here's the good news. The good news is that the Lord has given us three types of prayer altars. The first one is the personal prayer 
altar. This is what you begin to claim territory. Imagine, imagine every block in New York City has Christians praying and seeking God and punching through the dome of darkness and being able to gain territory. The ambience of heaven come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Just as it is in heaven, let it be here. Take dominion. You're the king. Every king has a kingdom. Oh, come on, somebody. And when you have a kingdom, you have dominion. I'm here to tell you when you begin to call upon the name of the Lord for your neighborhood, for your home, God begins to show up. See, Noah, Noah built an altar to the Lord. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 8, the first thing that he did when he got on the altar, the first thing he set up an altar. It was an altar of communion with God. As a matter of fact, let me go a little back because the Lord reminded me I didn't have it in my notes, but the Lord, thank God, he's merciful with the preacher. And when I, 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 I was reminded and I asked myself, well, what was the first altar that we find? And I find Abel. And Abel gave all his first fruits. What we call today the time. But he, what he did, he gave a sacrifice to the Lord. And Cain got jealous. I want to tell you that whenever you set up an altar, a prayer, you will get attack. The enemy will come after you. The spirit of Cain will arise and will try to come against you. But even, even if you were to die for the cause Hallelujah. For the cause of Christ. The Bible says in the book of Hebrew that the blood, the blood of Abel to this day is still crying out. But there is a greater blood that will spill at the cross of Calvary. It is the blood of Jesus, the greatest sacrifice of all sacrifice. And that blood is still crying out. And that blood, we could use that blood in the name of Jesus against Satan and say, Satan, the blood of Jesus. Jesus is against you. The blood of Jesus is against you. Now it's time to pray. It's time to seek the Lord. And you see Abraham, Genesis chapter 12, verse 7. And the Bible says that the Lord appeared to Abraham and he set up an altar. Watch this. When you read after that, he's, the Bible says, then he built, wherever he went, he built an altar and the Lord would appear to him. You see, he learned that when you have an altar, the presence of God begins to show up. When you have a prayer altar, when you dedicate, and you're just not going through some motions, you're not just reading some. Some people just read prayers. God's not interested in for you reading prayer. What well, he's interested in hearing your heart, for you to cry out to him and be real with God, be sincere with God, have a relationship with God, pierce through the darkness. And so everywhere he moves, he set up an altar so he could claim territory. And that, that today is known as Israel. And then not only him, but I, what I love is his children. His Jacob learned about that. And the Bible said that in Genesis 35, verse 7, that he set up also an altar to the Lord. As a matter of fact, he had an experience of an open heaven. And, and, and then he saw angels ascending and descending. I want to tell you that when you, glory to be to God, when you set up a prayer altar, this heavenly activity that is taking place right where you are. I don't know about you, but I want my guardian angels around me. I need my spiritual bodyguards everywhere I go. You see the actors and the celebrity. Now, there's some fake celebrity that has, they, they have security and nobody's after them. <laughs> but when you have something of value, you need security. Well, you have the treasure of heaven inside of you. You have the greatest message in all planet Earth. You got the presence of God. You got the word of God. You got sanctity in your life. You got consecration in your heart. So the enemy is going to try to come against you. But thank God that we have God's secret service. Amen. You may not see them, but they're with you. Turn to at least three people and tell them he's, they're with you. They're with you. They're with you right now. That's why you got to be careful what you do. When you engage on ongoing sin in your life, I'm just going to call out what preachers are not saying today. But I have to. I am preaching. Hallelujah. Let me tell you, 
When you open up that gate, and I'll be talking about that in the coming weeks. When you open that gate, it affects the angels around you. You disarmor your own army. Hey, and so, so beloved, let's, let's create the El Bethel. Like Jacob did. El means God. Bethel means house. The house of God. The Bible says my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. But then you could have a family altar. A family altar is when, amen, uh, when, whenever you, as a family, you decide to pray together. Job did something very similar to that. In Job chapter 1 verse 5. As a matter of fact, the Bible said that he will offer a sacrifice. There was an altar that he had in case uh, that one of his children was sin. And, and so husband's wife. Some of you used to do it. Get back to it. Amen. Make it a priority because the family that prays together stays together. That's not just a nice slogan. As a matter of fact, every research show that families that go to church every week, I didn't say once a month, every week, every week, and they, they, they get engaged in church, their children do better in every category. They do better in school and mental health, emotionally. There's not a category where we get beat. The problem is that we're not consistent. The problem is that we see church as an option. And, and as long as you make it an option, the enemy is winning. So I want to encourage you, beloved. To have family out there together. It doesn't have to be long. Ten minutes together. What you're going to find is you're going to end up doing longer. Pray for one another. Read the Bible. Each one of you just, just read a portion of the scripture together. It just bring unity to the family. And then we have a church altar. Now the beauty about a church altar is that all the altars come together. Amen. So we got a bonfire. And I'm here to tell you new life has a big fire. And even when you're having a bad day in prayer, the benefit of being in the house of God is that when everybody else may have that day in open heaven, you could join in that open heaven. That's why it feels so great to come to church, right? You can have a bad day, you can have a bad week, you can have a bad month, but as soon as you walk through that door, you know what happened. As soon as you walk, he says something different. As soon as you walk, you're in God's soul. As soon as you walk, you know God's angels are in the house. As soon as you're here, you know you got protection. As soon as you walk in, you got the wall of fire. But that wall is not staying here. We're taking it to the street. Every day we're having prayer meetings going on right here at 6 o'clock. At 6 o'clock, listen, at 6 o'clock. Can somebody say 6 o'clock? Turn to the other person and say, neighbor, have you been here for the 6 o'clock prayer meeting? Say amen or ouch. We need the full armor of God. Because then we go in the streets, amen, and then the team goes out. Now, I was in Africa. I wasn't being able to participate, but I'm re-engaging this week, amen, with my wife. We want to come every day. We Really. <laughs> Pastor told me, listen, I, I, let's go every day. I, I want to be here every day, not because I'm the pastor. Before I'm a pastor, I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God like everybody else. But I want to tell you, we're going to go, and, with the, and the, Jericho, uh, the Jericho walk are taking place, amen. The botanicas are going to come down. The dark, listen, the, the altars of darkness are going to come down. Every activity of Satan, you're going to see the numbers. You're going to see the, mark my words, the numbers are going to change in our neighborhood because we're building the firewall together. Now, if you believe that, put your hands together to Jesus. That leads me to the second point. I'm running out of time here. You got to map your region. The Bible says that the Lord spoke to Moses saying, send out men for, for yourself to spy out the land of Canaan. He needed to understand what is the situation. And what he found was giants. In the New Testament, they call it the strong man. See, the battle that you're having, there's a strong man there fighting it. In the Bronx, we have many. The New York Times call 
the biggest Santero place that we have here, biggest warehouse with 10,000 articles for sale. They call it the Home Depot. They call it the Home Depot of the occult, so to speak. 1959, this started. You ever notice what happened after 1959 in the Bronx? Prior to 1959, crime was down. Everything was well. After night, look at the 60s, look at the 70s. How many of you live here during the 60s and 70s and 80s? This was a war zone. Still a war zone. We had two kids get shot right in the corner over here. They go to our church in a Spanish service. That's when I started getting angry. That's when I said we can't just have a church. That's the problem with our churches. We just want to have a church. We come here. Oh, let's, uh, you know, let's go to a hiding place. God didn't call you to hide. God says, put on the full armor of God. Let's go do battle. I feel like fighting. I feel like a Gideon is rising. I feel like the Deborahs are rising up. They're ready to pull out the full armor of God and say, you're not going to touch our children anymore. You're not going to touch our grandchildren anymore. You're not going to touch this generation of young people anymore. Where is the army of God? Where is the army of God? Let the enemy of God rise and the enemies be scattered. Let's get the church out of the building. Out. We got to go. We got to go. You got to understand. We have two society of Satanists right here in the Bronx. I mentioned to you in that area that's now one spirit-filled church. You got, and I'm going to say it, and it's not my dear sister, glory to God. But you got politicians here whose, whose parents and grandparents are high priestess. And the dark side. I, I'm not making this up. This is very real. It is a fact. The fact is that there's a power behind the power. Wherever you see power and authority, you're going to see the devil trying to get in so he could have influence. But we're not going to allow that in the Bronx. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired of Bronx hurting. And I believe that it's time for the church, the greatest army on planet Earth, to rise together. And if you don't believe that it's a devil, the devil got you. He did the best job on you. He did a good job on you. This is why he knocked out your prayer, li your prayer life. This is why he's trying to do everything possible to take away your connection with God. Or spending time with the Lord. Spending time with one another. He wants to. The hyenas are going after Christians who stand all by themselves. But together, no weapon. I said no weapon. Form against us shall prosper. Can I go a little longer, church? The last thing we got to do. The last thing we got to do. By the way, let me just say this. You got to do some spiritual house cleaning in your house. Some of you, some people give you stuff, throw it in the garbage. All this little, oh, I so cute. That little black ball with that little eye. Really? Like, really? You see, what he throws is fear. You see, oh, if I take it off, then what's going to happen? Well, I'm going to tell you if you keep it, you're blocking the blessing. You're blocking the move of God. Do you realize that the enemy sometimes will give you stuff to keep you busy? He'll give you wealth. He tried it with Jesus. I'll give you everything. What is it that you want? He wants to make a deal with you. Pastor, have you ever had the devil make a deal with you? Oh, all the time. Listen to me. He'll tell you, and this leads me to the last point. You got to drive out the strong man. He says, you can't take over the house unless you drive out the fully armed guard. And there's a guard. Jesus not making this stuff up. He knew the spiritual world way better than we did. 
that we do. As a matter of fact, he didn't say a. He is translated when a strong man. But I looked it up in the Greek. It literally says the strong man. Let me, let me give you a story so you can understand what I'm trying to tell you. I met a pastor. I met a pastor. His name is Pastor Julius. And he says, where I am from, he says, I couldn't get a property. I, couldn't, I was sharing the testimony how God blessed us with this building and how difficult it is for churches. And not only God gave us a building, he gave us a beautiful building, state-of-the-art building. And it's paid for. He goes, you know, I have a story to tell you, he told me. He says, he said to me, he said, you know, that I, 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 I felt like I was hitting a wall. I, I, we couldn't find land, and the, 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 the monies were not coming in. So the Lord told him, go to prayer and fasting for a whole week. He prayed and fast at the end of the week. The Lord revealed what it was. He says it was a strong man, a demonic principality that was fighting him. He's a man that is on fire of God. And something happens when you gain land, when you, when you have property, you, 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 you put your stake in that territory. He said, we're here and we're not leaving. And, and so he said, when he came against the strong man, he goes, Pastor Fernando, you will not believe what happened. The doors began to open. We now have, this is, he's from Nairobi, Kenya. He says, now I have five acres of land in one of the most difficult places to get it. God blessed us. I wonder what's being held back because you have a strong man that is fighting you, your family, your children. Come on. And your job. And wherever you are, he's trying to block you from your promotion so you can have influence over people. The fact is, as a matter of fact, Pastor John Melinda, who's, who's planning to come here in, in May, God has used him literally to change nations. And... He, a man of authority, and he, he, he told me this story. He says that, that uh, he got called in his early days as a Christian because there was this church that went from 300 to three people. Now, that would be pretty depressing to go from 300 to three people. He says, this has to be spiritual. They, if you build it up to 300, 300 is just a lot of people. And to go that quickly to three people. So the Lord showed him a dream. He was dreaming. And in that dream, he saw that in that village, in that village, he saw a forest. And out of the forest came this dark cloud and came over that church. Now in that church, he saw that they were singing but they were not worshiping. He saw that the preacher was preaching, but he was just entertaining people. So that dark cloud came like a tornado, and Christians in that dream started bouncing all over the place. They just poof. Some of them cut in half. Just, and then the cloud lifted. It went back to the forest. So he's like, we have a strong man here. He started to preach. He said, nobody will get saved. They did those evangelistic meetings. They were praying. But then he, they started to pray and said, Lord, show us the strong man. There was this man that was coming and would sit right in the middle. <laughs> and that man, when he will come, and at times, at the end of the service, when he got up, everybody will leave. And he will end up only with the children. So they asked for the ladies who knew them. I, I want to talk to I, I, We want to talk to him. And to make a long story short, they were able to have a conversation. And the man who had been like a warlock, he was tired of it. He was tired of the suffering. He was tired of, of the, the, the captivity that he had lived. But he was scared to death. He said, they will kill me. These demons will kill me. And he, he began to explain a lot of things that I don't have time for. But the man, listen, the man got saved. He got set free. He got delivered. And from that moment forward, souls started coming. The other warlocks and witches left. 
And then all of a sudden, the economy changed in that, in that village. And now to this day, they're serving the Lord. Can somebody say amen? amen? Some of you, you have made a pact in the past with the powers of darkness. It's time to break the contract. I said it's time to break the contract with evil spirit and said enough is enough. That's what they did in the children of Israel, the spirit of Pharaoh, and said no deal with you. Did you know when Pharaoh wanted to leave, he says you could leave and just take the men. Leave the wives behind. And then, leave, and then he says no, no deal. And then he says, okay, but leave your children. You, your generation could come. That's what's happening right now. Look out for yourself. Forget your children. Forget their spiritual walk and your kids. Uh, and you got your thing. I'll go to church by myself. Forget. I'll let the kids stay home. No, you bring the kids. You make them go to school. Make them come to the house of God. It's not an option. I never give that option to my kids. And they're both pastors today. Not because I told them to be pastors. All I care is that they serve the Lord with all of their hearts. That's all I care. Titles, I, I don't care about titles. Amen. What I care is do you love Jesus? The point that I make, and then he said, I, I, you could leave well, but leave the wealth. Because if you had the resources, you could move things. But Moses said, no deal. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, no deal. Tell at least three people. Tell them, no deal. No deal. Tell the devil, no deal. I break contract today. Tell them, I break it. I break it. I feel the spirit of the Lord in this place. He's about to break. He's about to break. He's about to break. Oh, I got to stop right here. He's about to break. Something is about to break in this place. Your past is about to break. The chains are about to break. Something is about to be loosened and unleashed because God is about to break the strong man in your life. You got to break. It has to break. There's nothing the devil could do about it. There's nothing that the enemy could do about it. It got to break. That which has come against your marriage, it got to. That which has come against your children, it got to. That which has come against your prayer life, it got to. That which has come against your ministry, it got to. That which has come against our church, it got to. It got to. It got to. It got to. It's going to break church. And if you believe that, give a shout of victory, a shout of jubilee. I'm so glad that you received God's word today. But right now, I want to lead you to the greatest decision in your life. There's a decision to follow Jesus, to receive him as your Lord and Savior. I know what you're going to say. You're going to be like, but I, I don't know how to do that. What I, I want to tell you. That I want to lead you into a prayer. It's a prayer of forgiveness where you're going to invite Jesus to be the Lord of your life so he could change you and transform you and you could become a child of God. There is no greater thing that could ever happen in your life and no greater difference making moment in your life than this one that is about to happen. So I, I want you to just pray this brief prayer and, and, and let it come from the bottom of your heart. I want you to pray, say, Lord Jesus, coming to my life. I repent and I turn to you for mercy and for grace. I receive you as my King and Savior. Thank you, Jesus. You're the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name. Let me tell you something. If you meant that, I want to encourage you to now follow Jesus with all of your heart. Spend time with Him in prayer. Get a hold of a Bible. You can even get a Bible app nowadays and begin to grow and get connected to a church. If you don't have a home church, we want to invite you to new life. So I'm going to ask now Pastor Carlos to talk about uh, some of the great opportunities that we have here in New Life and how you can get connected 
at New Life Church. Thank you so much for joining us here, joining New Life Bronx. We are so glad that you tuned in to watch today. And we just want to let you know that if you want to join us in person and experience this in real life with other people here in our building, you can do so every single Sunday. Come on over to 2757 Morris Avenue in the Bronx, New York, where we are live every Sunday at 1045 a.m. in English and 12.30 p.m. in Spanish. If you want to know more about our services, about our small groups, conferences, and other things that we have going on in this community, you can catch our website on www.newlifebronx.com or you can visit us on our socials. We have YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, at New Life BX. Join our socials today so that you can stay up to date with all the great things that are happening here at New Life. Thank you so much for watching and we hope you have a blessed day.